Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're with us to worship God, and God is glad you're here today. We worship every Sunday in person at LCPC at 10 a.m. Normally, on most Sundays, we have two services. One is in the sanctuary. It's a contemporary service. The other's in our newly renovated chapel, and that's a classic service. This Sunday, we're going to be all together in the sanctuary for one combined service. And after that, we're having brunch together out in the courtyard. So we hope that you'll consider joining us this Sunday for uh, those events. Also, we are here for you. If you have any questions about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to walk with Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about that. So don't hesitate to contact us. There is a fountain that drowns our rose. There is no. 
Welcome to today's service. Here are some of the events coming up at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. Peak continues on Wednesday evenings with dinner at 545 and classes and events beginning at 630. Andy will continue his class, More Like Jesus, while Lee is uh, continuing his class called Living Wisely, discussing how to live a truly meaningful and joyful life. There are also adult small groups for couples and parents and activities for children and students. On Sunday, May 15th at 2 p.m., the deacons will present Strike Up the Band, a benefit performance to raise funds for the Deacons Higher Education Scholarship Fund. Vocalists and a 10-piece professional band will perform pop, swing, jazz, gospel, TV, and movie themes in this high-energy show. Tickets will be available in the breezeway after Sunday services at a suggested donation of $15 per adult and $30 per family. This Sunday, May 1st, our signups for our multi-church build days begin in the courtyard where we will be enjoying our church-wide lunch. We will be working alongside volunteers from Friendship Pasadena Church, La Cañada Presbyterian Church, and Pasadena Church. This is a chance to help build affordable housing for two families, and a chance to make new friends while joining God in what He is doing in Northwest Pasadena. We will be working on two homes at the corner of Howard and Navarro. No experience required, as we will be guided by expert Habitat staff. All individuals 16 or over are encouraged to join us. We will have two shifts each day, 8 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. and 11.15 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. If we have enough volunteers, some will be working on some projects at the Harambe Center across the street from the build. So come to the table, the sign-up table, on your way to the food table.
Our first scripture reading for today comes out of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1 through 19. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening. And there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give a light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. This is the word of the Lord. We stand in need of forgiveness. We stand in need of God's grace. So let's go to him now and confess to him. Gracious Father, we are here today worshiping together because we love you, but we bow in your presence because we haven't loved you as we should. We confess today that we have often disobeyed you. We've failed to live as sisters and brothers united in Jesus. We haven't leaned on your power and strength. We haven't sought your guidance. Lord, we haven't forgiven our enemies or prayed for them as you've commanded us to do. We haven't shared the good news of your gospel with our neighbors and friends. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. God, we lay all this before you and ask for your forgiveness. We ask you to change us from within. Lord, we are hungry today to be close to you, to receive your grace and mercy. So we pray that you'd help us to see our sin, that you'd help us to see your face and the faces of the people around us. Would you teach us to follow your example and to serve one another in love? And we pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our second scripture reading comes from Genesis, chapter 1, verse 20, through chapter 2, verse 3. 
And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there, there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. The Word of God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the good creation that you um, have given to us, Lord, that you have given to us to rule over. And Lord, we thank you that we are part of that uh, creation. We thank you that you uh, lovingly uh, made us and formed us. Uh, Lord, we pray that we would give you glory, that we would give you thanks and praise uh, Lord, most of all, we pray that you'd help us to be fruitful uh, for your kingdom. And Lord, we pray uh, that the good news would come not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, in full conviction. Amen. I don't know about you, but my grandparents seemed to be able to do everything, right? There was nothing they didn't know how to do. I, I remember as a kid, my, my mama would make butter and right, and she could sew and she uh, she could garden and she, well, she couldn't cook that well. And I know, I, I know you're not supposed to say bad things about your mama. Uh, and I love her, loved her dearly. I still love her, uh, but she really didn't cook very well. I, I know it's a stereotype, right? Southern grandma that can't cook, but it's really true. But she could do so many other things. And and my papa could do everything. I mean, he, he could weld and he could fix uh, washing machines. I mean, he just seemed, they just seemed to know how to do everything. And it kind of got me wondering, you know, now I'm an adult and I have kids and I can't do anything. And I, I don't know, I can't fix anything. I don't know how to make anything. I can't really, you know, I, I don't know how to do anything. And I began to ask, 
is it our education system that's failed us? Is it our culture that's collapsing all around us? And I began to think about what they did, you know, how they grew up. And part of it, they really knew how to do everything because they couldn't buy anything, right? They had to make everything they ate and wore. And I mean, they had to do those things. But something else happened, and, and sociologists are now kind of pinpointing a few things. One of the things that happened was that during the Great Depression, there was a great surge in hobbies and home profit projects, right? In, in the Great Depression, people uh, lost their jobs, and all of a sudden, they had, not only did they have time on their hands, but they needed money. So they began to, not only had they learned how to do these things as children, right, but they began to, uh, to practice these things. And, and during the, the Great Depression, we began to see a lot of hobbies take home and, and home for-profit projects, right? Leatherworking and, and, and welding and, and metalwork and all of these things, they began to pop up in, uh, in people's lives. Now, fast forward, uh, I don't know, 100 years, right? During the, during the COVID depression, during the COVID lockdown, the same thing happened. Have you noticed, I mean, I, just a show of hands there, there while you're watching your computer, how many of you tried to make sourdough bread during this, during the, the, the COVID depression, right? H how many of you, right? How many people did you see on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, wherever, right? They, they began to make projects. People began to do woodworking and people began to make bread and they explored, you know, painting. I knew people that started painting with watercolors and, and now we're making these beautiful paintings. Right, what happened was is people had time on their hands and for some people, they realized they needed maybe an extra way of making some income. And, and what's happened in, just in, in our own current time is that people's skill levels have actually gone up, right? All of a sudden people learned how to fix their sink and unclog their toilets all by themselves, right? They began to do things because they had time. And I love this. I love it. I love hobbies. I love, uh, I, I have my own hobbies of woodworking and sleeping. And I, I really do. I like, I love this idea, this arts and crafts movement that we see going on around us. I mean, people have started quilting, uh, you know, in, in droves. It made me think, and one of the things that happened was I, I began to think about hobbies. What, what could I take up? And, and, and I began to remember my love in, in, when I was in high school of painting. And that love was really inspired by one person, and that was Bob Ross, right? He was this PBS guy. In fact, Bob Ross has made a comeback, right? Even teenagers right now know who Bob Ross is. He, he's sort of a cultural icon again. I began to think about what Bob Ross does, right? And, and why he's so, I don't know, appealing. Right, because in, now we're all doing it on YouTube, right? But you get on YouTube and, and, in, and in about 29 minutes, he goes from blank canvas to finished picture, right? And you can watch this thing and you, and you see at one, and he also, it's fun to look at his hair and it, it's fun to you know, hear him talk and write and tell us stories about his squirrels and whatnot, right? Like, I mean, it's great. But it's this idea that he takes nothing, right? That's just a blank canvas and creates something. It's that creativity. We marvel at it. And in this, we see who God created us to be, right? We see that God is this creator. Now, a couple of weeks ago for Easter, we talked about God's new creation. We talked about when Isaiah says, God is going to create new heavens, a new earth. And we see that in Jesus, right? We see how John told the story about a new creative story. If you didn't see that one, you can just go back a couple of weeks on just on the page below and you can, you can see that, that sermon. But today we're going to go back to the blueprint. What is it about creation that, that, that it just fascinates us, right? It, it draws us into who this God is. And I want you to look, this story is, is somewhat different. It's a different kind of story. It's not told the way we normally think of creation stories. In fact, it's, it's told, um, this, this creation story is told in a, in a way that is similar to creation stories that existed at the time when this story is written. Now, you're going to hear me say the word story, and you're going to say, wait a minute, Lee, are you saying that it's not true? Are you saying it's a myth, right? And I don't mean that at all. This story is absolutely 100% true, but it doesn't tell us the facts, right? It doesn't tell us, it, it, it's not giving us a scientific 
telling of how this world came to be. That's not the point of the story. And, and the reason why I keep using the word story is because I, I want you to ask another question. Is the story of the Good Samaritan true? Right? Well, Jesus tells the story of a Good Samaritan, but the, the, that's not a, it's not a factual story. There is no real Good Samaritan. But is the story true? Well, of course it's true because it tells us the truth about who God is and who we are. And this story, this creation story works the same way. In fact, we're going to look at the story, and I'm going to show you that this, that Genesis never meant was meant to be taken as, as a here's how this happened and here's the progression. It's that's not the way the story is told. The story is told to us in a way that helps us see what God was doing and the purposes for which God created the world. So I want you to see that with me, and you'll see this on the screen, and I'll try to point it out now. When we hear this story, and it's probably a familiar story, right? There's six days of creation and one day of rest, right? And you're going to see how this works out. But I want you to notice that there are some strange things about this. And once again, you'll see this on the screen, and I'll, I'll point it out to you. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And let's start, start here. It says God begins his creative process now. Now listen to this in verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty, it was void, it, it, it wasn't, it had no shape, it had no, really it even didn't even have any substance, it was empty. And darkness was over the face of the, of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now what, what's happened, what we see here is a picture of things in disarray. Have you, have you ever walked into your room and seen, you know, your mess and you're like, hmm, this room is in disarray. And, and actually, I, I was just in my kid's room, my teenager's room, right? And I went in and I said, holy moly, right? This, this place is formless and without void and darkness hovers over the abyss, right? That's what it looks like. If you've ever been in a teenage room, teenager's bedroom, it's like darkness hovers over the abyss. That's what it feels like, right? It feels like descending into the netherworlds when you go into a teenager's bedroom, or at least my teenager's bedroom. Right, what's happening here, though, is that the story, Genesis is telling us a story. He says, the world was not the way it should be, right? Now, you're, we're going to get some questions, and, and I can't field every question, right? Because some of you are saying, wait a minute, didn't God create heavens and earth out of nothing? Yes, but the story here that we're being told in Genesis is not necessarily that story. Yes, we hear that God creates out of nothing, um, right? John 1 tells us that in the beginning, that God created the heavens and the earth, right? And, and that everything, uh, you know, came from Jesus, that he, that everything that we see around us was made by God um, through Jesus, um, for Jesus, right? It was all made. This is, it's all created out of nothing. But when Genesis is telling us the story, Genesis is telling us a story to see that God's taking these parts of the world that aren't what they should be, and then God is going to bring order. Now, and, and we're going to see how this happens. Remember, the earth was formless and was, and was void, right? It, 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 was, it was empty and shapeless, and darkness hovered over the abyss. Now, here's the thing. Darkness hovering over the abyss doesn't bring life, does it? Life is important fruitfulness is important. We're going to see this, and this is going to be one of our major themes, right? But let's look at how the story goes. Once again, you'll see this on the screen. He says, and God said, let there be light. Remember, what's the problem? The earth is formless without void. There's darkness over the face of the earth, right? Uh, you know, there's, there's darkness is there, but God says, let there be light, because you need, in order to have life, in order to have fruitfulness, in order to have flourish, in order to have any kind of flourishing, we need light. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. And God called the light, uh, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And this word separated is really important in the Genesis account of creation. Why? Because God's taking this formless void, this shapeless thing, and he's creating, he's separating it. He's cutting it and, and making it to where it should be. He's dividing things up and putting them in their proper place. In the, and that's a, an important thing, the proper place, the place that brings life, the place, the, the place that brings order to the universe. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning and that's the end of the first day. Now, here's the thing. 
day one, God creates light, right? He says, there, here's, we're going to have light and we're going to call the light day and we're going to call the night, uh, the darkness night. It's going to be great. Except, did you see what was missing? There's no sun. There's no moon. There's no stars. There's nothing that actually gives light, right? Did you notice that? Do you know where that comes? That is on day four. Day four. Now, see, if you look, look on the screen here, it says day one, right? God creates light and dark, and he creates day and night. But on day four, he creates the actual things that can give light, like the sun and the moon and the stars. And day four, he says this, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. You see, what God is doing, and there's a real structure to this. Remember I told you that this, this story is not meant to tell us how, how things came to be the way they are. That's not the point. The point of the story is not how, but why. What's the purpose, right? That's what Genesis is trying to get us to understand. What is the purpose of this creation? Why did God do what he did? And who does that? who are we to, in, in this creation, right? That's what, that's what Genesis is trying to tell us. So if you see this, the first three days, what does God create? The first three days, he says, let there be light. And so God creates night and day. But he doesn't create the stars and the, and the moon and the sun until day four. But on day two, what does he do? Remember, the ancient world, they believe that, and it makes sense, right? If you look up in the sky, the sky is blue. Well, unless you're in California, and then it's kind of brown. But if you look up most places, right, the sky is blue. Right, and you, and you look at the water below and the water is blue. And so it made sense to them that there was water up there, right? And guess what? Every now and then water falls down on you. It makes sense that there'd be water up there, right? And they believed there was water up there and there was water below. And what does God do on the second day? God creates a dome and that word firmament, nobody knows what firmament, what does firmament mean? I don't know, who knows? You know, it means a dome. Right, and God took, just so you know, and, and I, I grew up in Louisiana, and we have the Superdome, right? It makes sense, we just call it a dome, right? What does God do? He puts a dome. It's see-through, but it's a dome. And he, what the dome does is separate, remember? Order, bringing things to life, right? He separates the water up there from the water down here. And the water and, the, and that dome thing, he says, well, that's the heavens, that's the sky. And the water down here, well, that's the seas. Right? So think about it, what he does, he creates the water up there so that it protects us. Water up there, water down here. Now on the third day, God says, now let's have the water under the down here water, let's have that water divide again. Right? We're going to take some water and we're going to push it over here and put all the water together over here and all the water together over here. And when it does that, the land, we can actually see the land now. And he says, and the water, he calls the seas and the land and the, the dry parts, he calls, well, that's the land, the earth. So he creates. So what you see is you see someone like Bob Ross here. Now, I'm not comparing God to Bob Ross, but, but you see where I'm going. Bob Ross first, he sets the stage, right? He, he paints uh, places where he, can, where he can put things. And then the second set of three days, remember it's the first three days and the second three days, the second three days, he begins to fill in those places, right? So the first day, he creates sky, he, he creates the light and the dark. And then on day four, right, the second, the first of the second set of three days, he creates the star, the sun, the moon, and the stars to populate, right, the, this place, this light and dark. On day two, he creates the waters up there, the, the, the sky, and he basically makes the sky and then the oceans. And on day five, Right? What do we get? Fish and birds. Right? So we see he's he created on day two, he created a place where birds and fish could live. And then on day five, he puts birds and fish in there. Right? So like creates a nice tank and then fills it up. Now remember, on day three, God created the dry land and the seas. And on day five, what does he do? He populates the land. Right? And not only does he populate the land, but he creates human, he creates animals. And then on day five, oh, I'm sorry, on day six, right, when he's populating the land, right, what does he do? He creates human beings in his image. And we're going to talk about what it means to what it means to be in God's image next week. We're going to come back to that. But he creates human beings in his image, in God, in God's own image, right? And what are they to do? They are to rule the world. Now, they're not to rule the world as they see fit, 
right? This is not theirs to do with whatever they want because, well, this belongs to God. They are to rule as God himself would rule. They have been given a job to rule as God himself would rule the place, right? They are, I, what I like to think of as, they're the middle managers of creation, right? That's not, they don't get to make all the decisions, but they get to make some. And ultimately, the company doesn't belong to them, but they, get, they have an important role to play. And on day seven, right? So we see the first three days, the second set of three days, and then the last day, God rests, right? And I, and I love what it says. Gen, uh, Genesis uh, chapter um, thir- uh, 1, verse 31, it says, And God saw all that he made, and listen to this, it says, it was very good. Have you, did you see that as you were reading? God, on, at the end of each day, God looked at what he had done. He said, wow, that's really good. Right Now, very often we misunderstand this. We think, oh, God created this, and this thing in itself is good. In other words, the earth is a good thing. That's not really what he's saying. What God says when he looks at, the, at his work at the end of the day, he went, wow, that's really good. I did a great job. This is, and because good doesn't necessarily mean what we think it always means. Good means that it is producing what it's supposed to produce, that it's doing what it's supposed to do, that it is, it is good because God has created it and it's fulfilling its purpose. And so God says it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then on day six, the, seven, the, the, the last day of the week, or well, it's the sixth day of the week, the last day of work, What does God do? He looks at the world and with human beings in it, he says, now it's very good. It's very good, why? Because the world is about to be able to do what he has created it to do. Do you know what it is that he's created it to do? Listen to this. When God creates human beings, this is in chapter one, verse 28, it says, God blessed the humans and he said to them, he doesn't say this to any other parts of the creation. He doesn't give them the other parts of the creation any kind of command. But to the humans, he says this, be fruitful, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the uh, and birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You are to rule and to subdue. Now we're going to talk about what that means next week. But what I want you to see is that God has created this world, right? He's created his cosmos. And remember, it's his, it's not ours, it is his. He has created his cosmos to bear fruit, to be fruitful. In other words, it's sort of like God created this this universe in order to bear fruit. He created it for really his own glory so that his good his good creation, this good work that he had done, right? He, this good creation bears fruit. It creates, remember, God is the God of life. And right, and what, is this, what does this world do? This world produces life. It, it continues in that life-shaping, life-forming, life-affirming, right? It, it does these things. It bears fruit, right? That's how, when, you, when you're a gardener, right, you, you know, how are my tomatoes doing? Well, if your tomatoes plants are spitting out tomatoes, then you know it's good. It's doing what it's supposed to do, right? How do you know when things aren't good, right? The leaves start to get brown. The, 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 the fruit doesn't come out right. You're like, something's wrong. Why? How do we know it's wrong? Because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not doing what it was made to do. It's not doing, it's not fulfilling its purpose. But God says when he looks at the world and with human beings in it, now human beings are here, He looks at the world and he says, this is very good. This is going to produce what I wanted for it, was to produce fruit. And then on day seven, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, right? And because on it, he rested from the work of creation that he had begun. Now, very often we think that God's sort of, you know, went, you know, kind of saw his creation and said, ah, man, I'm really tired. I should go take a nap, right? Because that's what we think of when we think of resting. At least that's what I think of when I think of resting. 
But one of the things that we see about this story, remember I told you this story is similar to other stories. It's similar, but different, right? There's, there's a lot of similarity, but there's a lot of difference too. We don't have time to go into all of those differences. But one of the things that we see is that the stories told like this are stories about how, how these um, either kings or, or some of the other gods of the ancient world, how they create the cosmos and why they create the cosmos. But what we see, and John Walton, who is an Old Testament scholar, has sort of put forth this, this, this idea. Um, he tells us that in the ancient world, when people would have read this, they would have understood that what God was doing was building, building a cosmic temple, or, or maybe what we might even call a cosmic palace. And temple and palace here would, over, would sort of overlap. Now, what is he doing? He's creating this palace, this temple for himself. And he creates it, he, he sets the stage, and then he fills the stage, right? He sets all the first three days, he sets the stage, and then the second three days, second set of three days, he fills the stage, and then on the seventh day, he rests. And that word rest is, is not a word that means he went and took a nap. The normal way people would have understood this story is that the word rest means he was seated on a throne, right? God creates this wonderful temple, this, this holy temple for himself, this, this great cosmic palace. And then on the seventh day, he takes his seat and begins to rule. Right, think about what presidents do, right, in, in, our, in our culture and right, the presidential, we're, we're coming up on another election cycle, not a presidential election, but it feels like we never end our election cycles, does it? But think about what presidents do. They, 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 you know, they go through this, you know, process of getting elected, right? They go through election season. They, they try to, you know, they do all of their, you know, campaigning and they campaign and campaign and campaign. And sometimes it's like four years and then, and then finally they get elected. And what do they do? Do they go into the White House and just around do nothing? No. As soon as they go in the White House, what do they do? They start trying to govern. This is similar to what God does. God creates this cosmos. He creates this divine palace, this divine temple for himself. And then he, on the seventh day, he sits down and he begins to rule. And he does so through human beings, through his image in the world. Now, all of this is to help us see what is God doing? And who are we? in God's great scheme, in God's great plan. And that's an important thing. One of the things that we're gonna be, actually one of the things, we're gonna talk about three questions over the next few weeks and uh, the next month or so. We're gonna ask three important questions. Who are we? What's our identity? Where do we fit in? What do we do? How do we have, how do we belong, not only to this world, but how do we belong to one another? And the last question we're gonna ask is, what does it mean to live a good life? What, what good can I do in this world? How can I accomplish my purpose? So we're gonna ask those three questions, and I think Genesis will, will really give us a, a really good understanding of this purpose. But here's the thing. We see that God has created this world to rule, but God has done it by speaking. Right, did you see what God does? He says, every time he creates something, he says, and God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be a vault. And God said, let the water under the sky. And God said, let there be lights in the heavens, the moon and the stars and the sun. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures. And God said, let the land produce living, living beings. Let the, God, let, the, let the land produce animals. And 26, and then God said, let us make mankind. Let us make humanity in our image. And he does so. And God said, and God said, why? Because God's word is powerful. God's command, when, when God speaks, things happen. Words matter. God's words matter. 
He speaks and he creates. And I love what Isaiah has this same idea in Isaiah chapter 55. Remember, Isaiah is talking to people who, who, are, who have been sent away into exile, right? Who, who feel the, the sense that God's judgment is upon them. But then the last half of Isaiah is about God's redemptive purpose and plans for them. A new, a new heaven and a new earth. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And I love what it says. In chapter 55 of Isaiah, verse 9, it says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And listen to this. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood, bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So what's he saying? He says, just as the rains come down, and when the rains come down, it waters and nourishes the earth, and then the earth naturally produces fruit. Right? Just that's what happens, right? All of us can see that. So he says, just like that, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent. God's word is powerful. When God's word comes into the world, God himself is present with us, right? His word is his life-giving presence in us. And, and when he speaks, his word cannot be thwarted. His purposes cannot be changed. His word is powerful. Just as the rains water and create, remember, and think about the imagery, the, the rains create the fruit, right? So that you get seed for the sower and bread for the eater, right? It produces fruit. When God's word comes down, it produces fruit. It produces fruit. Now, what does that mean for us? Several times in Romans 10 and in 1 Corinthians 11, God talks about the power of God's word. He says that, that, that in Romans 10, Paul says that, that when God's word comes down, right, that, that we hear his word and his word is very near us, right? He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. He says the word of God is very near us. And then I love what he says this. In, when he's talking about communion, when he's talking about us sharing the Lord's Supper together, right, he talks about the, the symbolism, right? He says, you know, uh, he, he says that this is, Jesus is, is giving this meal and it's a Passover meal, and right? Instead of the, 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 the bread and the wine, he says, now this is my body and this is my blood, right? The, these things nourish us. And I love this. He says, um, he says in the same way, um, after he took the cup, uh, after he took the cup, he says, this is the new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we proclaim the Lord's word, it produces fruit. When we live the life that Jesus has called us to live, when we proclaim that, we actually, the word comes into the world and it produces fruit. Some of us, sometimes we think, oh, I've got to have all the clever answers. But God's word is what does the work. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we know that your word is powerful. And that your word can't return to you empty. It has to accomplish its task. It will accomplish its task. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to proclaim it. To proclaim it when we read it and preach it in church and listen. To proclaim it when we're out in our schools and classrooms and offices and with our kids and with our grandkids. But Lord, we also pray that as we, as we share the cup, as we share uh, the bread, Lord, that we pray that you would, we know that you are present here with us when we do it, that, that we proclaim your word and we proclaim your death. And Lord, when we do that, we bear fruit. So Lord, let us be fruitful for your kingdom, for your glory. And all God's people said together, amen. Thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. If you are new to us, we'd love to meet you in person at our Sunday services at 10 o'clock. We offer two styles of worship at that hour. Singing is led by our praise band in the sanctuary, 
while our choir leads a service with hymns and classical music in the chapel. We hope this has been a time of blessing and encouragement to you. If you find yourself drawing closer to God and would like to know more about what it is to follow Christ, please reach out to one of us here at the church. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>